We're going to talk about Austin's digital transformation. Um, and as you heard me say, howdy, as the normal greeting for all of us here in Texas. Uh, I'm Marnie Wilhite. I'm the head of digital transformation for the city of Austin. Um, and I'm Ben Kewen. I, uh, I work as the head of design for the Policy Lab at Brown University. And I was formerly uh, head of, uh, at the city of Austin, um, where I've served as head of design technology policy. And then previously, I was in the federal government at the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. Um, and so how we started this thing in Austin about three and a half years ago um, actually got profiled by Route 50 um, in terms of how it was taking stuff from the federal government and trying to do them at the, use it at the local level. Specifically stuff like the US Digital Service, 18F, and the Technology and Innovation Fellows Program at the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. They all brought in dozens of uh, experts from the private sector um, to try to build new types of teams around digital. And one of the themes that we found is that sort of expertise um, is really irreplaceable. You really can't outsource the knowledge of how to do these things. You need to bring in people who have done it before. Um, and so we created a fellows program with four high-level goals. Um, one was to work directly with departments. Um, so this was the idea that you can't go in a black box and improve a service and say, here it is. Like The departments have to be shoulder to shoulder. Everyone's rolling up their, um, their sleeves to work on it. Um, the second and third were to introduce and refine processes for user experience design, user-centered design, and like open source digital development. Um, and then the fourth, um, which has been part of the conversation, is uh, how do we create a, a creative culture that inspires more people to want to join the city? We're never going to be able to compete on salary, um, but if we have this culture of meaningful work, that can make the difference. Um, and so we were not the only people trying to do this sort of change in work. And at the same time, New York City had a website their tech jobs website, which had the very bold header of work for the greatest city in the world. And so in an open source, this was open source on GitHub, so we were able to fork it and change the headline to work for the coolest city in the world. <laughs> um, and then we even went so far as having Mayor Adler tweet at Mayor de Blasio uh, about how we improved it. Um, <laughs> So uh, in doing this, we brought in our initial cohort was about 15 designers and developers to work on different projects across the city um, in new ways where we're looking at how do we map out processes. This was the team working at how do we think about residential permitting in a way that's more user-centered and, and easier to use. And so across 18 months, we were able to really push out a few uh, early projects that had tangible outcomes, like the project at permittingatx.com around how do you get a residential permit for like a shed or a deck? Make that really simple. Um, and uh, Marnie will talk to about a couple other efforts that we did there. Yeah, so the other one we'll mention is ARR. We wanted to make sure that we looked at um, behavioral insights as well. So obviously technology needs to be put in the right places. And a lot of times you have to understand how you can nudge the public on uh, kind of changing their approach to work. And then we're also working on uh, the digital infrastructure for Austin's digital services. Uh, so. Out of this, this, the first 18 months of that uh, experiment, we were able to show that this was really valuable to the city. We could actually kind of change outcomes. So we developed a new office, the Office of Design and Delivery. Um, we took cues, again, from the federal government. So if you're familiar with the US Digital Services, this is their mascot, a crab with the Jedi uh, sabers. And it's you know, something that makes us think a little bit more whimsical about government. It's OK to work here. It's not going to be stodgy and cold. We are the love chickens, uh, because we love chickens. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> we own like 30 chickens over the course of the office. Um, the name, again, is Office of Design and Delivery. And the acronym spells out odd, because we're keeping Austin odd. Uh, and we do things like have parties where we have chickens. Uh, we're not quite at the extreme level at the federal government. This is Matt Cutts, the man who runs the US Digital Services. I have not dressed up in a costume like this yet, but you know, the year's not over. Um, and really, the big change that we pushed on all of our work, including how we formed uh, our office and how we continue to work on it, is to be agile. So, you know, do something and learn something. We often get stuck in these cycles of just trying to explore what the possibilities are. A lot of times, if you just try something really quick, you're going to learn whether it's going to work or not, and then you move on to the next possibility. So in that vein, uh, one thing that we learned over the last three years is that uh, the one-year model doesn't make sense. So bringing in a person for a year to help shape government is helpful. We'd like them to stick around for longer than that. So we're looking at uh, how can we create four-year terms to bring people into the city so that they can have a little bit more of a lasting impact, uh, but then you continue to have new thoughts brought into your government. 
And so um, a lot of this work made a lot of sense to us and a lot of the people we've hired. It's been about, about over 70 people in the past three years. Um, but sometimes people are like, well, why are you hiring more people? Why can't we do this ourselves? Um, and so this next section is kind of about the, the why behind digital transformation. Um, and so we started with the header that like everything has changed. Um, these are numbers from the Pew Centers in 2016 of use of the internet, home broadband at home, social media, smartphone ownership, and tablet ownership. Almost all of them are going from like zero. So we have these dramatic shifts where there's never been a moment where like we've decided, hey, government, we need to rethink this entirely. There's never been this, me this memo out of like you should t dramatically change your org chart. Um, and so these changes have happened. Um, and residents have been able to notice that technology doesn't take that long to stand up. So when Uber and Lyft left town because they were unhappy with our council's decisions, um, a nonprofit started uh, Ride Austin. In two and a half months, they had this up. And not only did it have parity with the feature set of Uber and Lyft, you could also round up your fare and donate it to charity. So this is what residents are expecting from technology. And then over the course of 2012 to 2018, um, the, the AustinTexas.gov, the city's primary website, uh, didn't really change demonstrably other than the background color. Um, and so this, this difference here um, is, is of, uh, eroding trust in government. Um, and then you're also seeing things like long lines and, and paper processes. Yeah, when our digital services aren't available to the public, then they're going to show up and wait in these lines, right? And that's not necessarily the best experience. Um, but really, we're concentrating on um, our, uh, our low-income residents. So for instance, we have a maternity program that focuses on African-American women. Um, and we imagine uh, one of these women trying to get to the program to get this health care. You're talking about an hour bus ride to get in, um, probably waiting there for an hour to finally be part of the program, and an hour home. So you're talking about a half day of work missed, feeding your kids versus a service from the city of Austin. So failing to support digital services disproportionately harms our low-income resi residents. Um, you know, we can say, well, maybe most of them don't have, or a portion of them do not have a desktop at home. Well, the majority, 95%, 96% yeah. of our residents actually uh, have a mobile device. Um, and so if we are actually designing our services for mobile, we have a better chance of giving them the services they need without having that loss of pay. This is pretty bad. Yeah. So as designers, uh, in this question, answering this question of having to get this bad, we ended up doing this uh, service blueprint of what is, what is the experience of trying to make a technology decision as a city employee? Um, and the themes that we saw here was that uh, the decision makers do not have the resources to make these, uh, these choices. Um, and so this is Julia, who works as a data architect. And she expressed this feeling that she's just on her own. She doesn't have the resources. She's trying to push forward, um, but, but like she doesn't know where to draw from. Um, what's true is that we also end up with keep with expensive and high maintenance technologies. This is John from Parks talking about how they're, they're seeing how many dollars are going into this technology, but there's not, no solution that stays and is resilient. Um, in a lot of cases, uh, people talk about how governments aren't spending enough money on technology. And the, the, the typical pattern is the governments are spending too much money on technology. They're just buying the wrong technology, and they're outsourcing the expertise, so they're getting trapped into high exit cost contracts. Um, and then. The net result of this is these headlines that fortunately we haven't seen in the city of Austin around um, million dollar contracts where the, the software never even shipped or worked. Um, and so one of the things that we really were, that was really f interesting about the, 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 or the service chart of the individual employee's uh, experience is that at the end, the technology didn't solve the problem. It wasn't even necessarily a technology problem. And so one of the thoughts around creating an office of design and delivery instead of an office of, te of tech or an Austin digital service is the idea that we need to think about the problem itself and framing how we might solve it before we go into starting to build something with technology. Um, and so at the net front, apologies for the headings not working here. Um, so this is eroding trust in government. Um, th these are emails to about AustinTexas.gov to the feedback channel. Um, one of them says, this website has me in a loop, cannot pay traffic citation online. This one from 2018, this is probably one of the worst websites to navigate. You cannot find anything. Um, 
But it, equally importantly, it's also eroding morale within the city. Like the employees that are reading these emails coming in don't actually have the power to change the technology platform. So they just they join government so they could make a difference. And our poor technology decisions are forcing them into a really bad job, a really a really uh, bad experience of, of employment. Um, so. But based on those themes, we're going to highlight three areas that, uh, that have made a better way forward. Yeah, so one of our biggest things is actually sitting down with residents. Um, we do research in their homes and their places of business. We go to the libraries and meet them where they are so we can find out information about what are they struggling with, what's hard about what they're doing. This is actually us testing at the DeWitty Center um, in East Austin. And this, uh, this gentleman that we're testing with was recently incarcerated, and he had never held a mobile device. So being able to look at how is he interacting with that, we're making sure people with low digital literacy can actually navigate the services that we're providing that they need. Uh, we're also looking at modular infrastructure. So we really want to make sure that uh, we can support the best technologies out there for our residents, our community members. So for instance, uh, we actually have multiple forms platforms out of the city of Austin. We want to be able to support the different complexities that we need to do by having this uh, API interaction with the front end where we can design the front end um, to be as accessible as possible, meeting AAA compliance for WCAG 2.0. We then can have multiple form systems on the back end so that departments can actually work the way they need to based on the technology that they have instead of getting stuck in one. Um, we are doing this in open source, so if you go to GitHub, uh, you can actually look at all of our solutions at the moment. And the biggest thing that we found is actually unlocking the potential of our civil servants. Uh, so we do workshops. We've figured out these kind of trainings that we need to do to get people with the newest skills to push forward with government today. And people are responding whenever we have government employees uh, go to those workshops or uh, actually test with the resident. This is uh, testing our, um, our new Austin.gov platform in Arabic with the current resident. Um, we are uh, committing to doing uh, manual translations for all the languages that we support. And the biggest difference there was her actually saying, wow, there, there was nothing for me before, and now there's something. Um, because Google Translate, while it's, it's continuing to improve, uh, is not necessarily the best way for people to actually find the information that they need. Um, and so we have launched with the Office of Police Oversight specifically, as Ben mentioned, you know, we want to look at more than the technology. We actually went into a deep dive with this department to look at how do we gain trust with our community uh, when it comes to police interactions. Um, originally, when we started looking at this, uh, a person would have to get a notarized affidavit and they had to take it into an office that is about 20 minutes north. Um, which does not have good public transportation to get there, and police are in the building as well. So you talk about someone who has had a bad experience with a police officer, um, and then you're putting them right in the same space. Uh, it was not exactly the, the best experience for our community. We weren't getting enough feedback. I think we were only getting about 50 complaints from the public a year. Um, so we looked at changing all of that. Our uh, police oversight office actually meets in libraries across the city now so that they have more availability to the public. Um, we also created this digital form, which again meets uh, WCAG AAA compliance for both a complaint and a compliment. Um, so we want to make sure that we're getting both of those feedback loops into the city. Uh, in the first two months after launching this, we had 70 uh, complaints come in and five thank yous come in for our police force. So more than what we were normally getting in a year, we got in two months. Uh, another big thing about being able to do this is be whimsical a little bit. Um, you know, we're talking about how to write content. It's as easy as uh, breakfast tacos. So we don't have to be serious all the time. Let's put a little bit of fun back into that. Yeah. And so this is also an example of um, the content guidelines that we use in order to help, uh, help staff across the city learn how to write better content, which, um, which is part of this question of how to scale. We have, we've been successful on individual projects, but each of those require you know, hiring folks from the private sector, scoping out. And, uh, and, and to, to change everything across the city of Austin, all 1,000 services, um, it'll take 30, 40 years. I don't think anyone thinks that's fast enough. Um, and so we're thinking about how we can work with other cities to make this, because in a lot of ways, every city is unique, but technology usually isn't one of them. We need case management, asset management, content management, forms, um, payments. Like these are, these are common technology problems that if we find solutions in one city, hopefully we can scale that to other cities and vice versa. Um, and so here are these high-level areas that we're thinking about. One of them is those shared technology platforms for service delivery. Um, alongside that is shared practices for in-person services, like going in to get a permit or 
um, a vaccine. Um, new standards for HR and procurement. This is foundational to doing everything else. Um, we want to increase the talent pipeline by 10 times. And right now, there's been a lot of effort in terms of how do we get people from Silicon Valley into government. Um, I'll tell you from experience, it's very hard and expensive. Um, there's not been enough thought about folks who haven't been imagining going into tech jobs and giving them the skills to learn how they can be a technologist in government. And government, in some ways, subsidizing that because it helps the entire community. And then if they end up joining the tech workforce, that's something that most cities need more talent in anyway. And so how can, how can governments be this launch pad for technology careers? Um, new workplaces to work and collaborate. Um, a lot of government buildings require a badge to get in. It ends up being pretty, uh, uh, pretty exclusive. It creates silos even within governments because a certain department can't access another department's building. Um, and we know from like spaces like Pixar, which was purposefully designed so that different departments would pass by each other throughout the day, that we really need to re rethink our spaces in order to get that power of proximity and conversation. And then a larger network for sharing best practices. Um, also, oftentimes, cities in Texas just compare themselves to other cities in Texas. There's this larger country called the United States that we can share with. Um, and broader than that, we're smart cities in Copenhagen or Singapore are much further ahead. And so we can't be limiting ourselves to our cities, our states, or our, even our countries. We need to be sharing this. And a lot of new networks, like uh, Apolitical, is a new publication out of the UK that's definitely worth joining, um, are, are starting to get that because we have the power of the internet to break down these barriers. Um, OK, and again, these are sort of the examples of the sort of components that, um, that we can share across governments. The police oversight form that Marnie was talking about was actually the form infrastructure was de developed by the US Digital Service for vets.gov for the VA. Um, and so we were able to reuse some of that code. And we want to continue that pattern. And then we're actually organizing an event on October 1st and 2nd uh, for folks who work for governments and universities in the region um, to start to share these practices. And the, the scope of this really gets at the, the complexity of working in government. So things like service design and design thinking, data science, AI, and machine learning in government, um, how to buy technology that works and evaluate them, um, how to think, apply venture capital methods to government technology investing, um, and the stuff around accessibility. Um, and uh, for these main stage presentations, we have um, Indy Johar from the UK talking about how they work together and how they're thinking about public-private partnerships, a panel on how what we need to know about AI and automation, um, and then stuff around laws, lobbyists, and municipal purpose, and how do we pilot new technologies that actually work for folks. Um, and then the Institute for the Future has a really great tool around thinking about the ethics of emerging technologies that we'll also be piloting with the group. Um, we like to include this quote because it's a presidential quote back when these things sounded presidential. Um, and uh, this is just the theme of how to scale is really thinking that we can only do so much with the city of Austin staff and budget. Um, and so how do we leverage all of the money that's going in and all of the work that's going into digital transformation across cities and states? So what you can do tomorrow. You want to do this one? Sure. Um, so, you know, as we mentioned earlier, as we iterated on what we've done uh, about the one-year model, we have uh, this publication in the Commons, uh, which is uh, New America's blog, um, talking about our approach. At the end of the article, it actually has uh, uh, links to resources that we've done for our interview processes, so the job descriptions we've been using, how we scope our projects, um, all of these kind of things are there, partnership agreements that we build with departments within our um, government. Um, there's also an apolitical article that we wrote about how to approach uh, technology. Um, one thing that I definitely highly recommend is this uh, piece by Mike Bracken and Andrew Greenway. Mike Bracken ran the UK Digital Services, probably one of the best known and uh, most successful uh, in the world. And the big thing that we took out of this that we definitely recognize, and, and probably you guys are seeing as well, is that we're, uh, when we look at the skills that are needed in government right now for digital transformation, that's been outsourced, uh, and we need to bring that knowledge back into the system. 
And hopefully those of you in the room that are from a government will join us for October 1st and 2nd. We're really excited. We piloted this last year um, with uh, about 120 people. We had people from the state attorney's general office, um, San Antonio, um, quite a few other government entities. And one of the things that uh, really struck people, this kind of the feedback that we got was, it was the first time they could sit down and be really honest. Because let's be honest, it, it's a little hard when you have vendors in the room to actually say exactly what's going on. <laughs> Cool. That's it. <laughs> Questions? Yes, sir. I think there's a microphone coming toward you. Hi. Um, I am actually from, well, I just recently transplanted planted from the greatest city in the world <laughs> to um, now the coolest city in the world. Um, Welcome. Thanks for helping me with that distinction. Good choices. Yeah. <laughs> Um, and I'm just curious, as somebody who is trying to bring design thinking into my work at the city of New York, um, have you seen um, some of the skills and things that you're teaching through your workshops actually take hold in agencies here within the city? And how, if you have examples? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, so we have uh, Austin Public Library worked with early on um, on these design thinking workshops. And we actually, uh, it started with a little bit of coaching of a, an employee there to actually organize what do they need for the internet uh, for the public library. It's a very complex department. The kind of things that they need during the day are very different than the rest of the city. Um, and so we uh, basically led them at a high level, facilitated this conversation, and now have requirements around what their next steps are. So they are ready to actually go out for a solution to solve for their internet problems. Um, another one would be um, the Office of Sustainability. They actually came to us and asked us to do uh, design thinking workshops uh, across a project. So specifically, when we do this, we apply it to a specific problem. We don't come in and just say, here's how you do design thinking, goodbye. Um, if you give them a project or if they come to you with a project and you start to take them through that process, it's a lot easier for them to understand how to actually apply it. So then once you go through that round, um, we actually walk out with tools, for instance, say, uh, if we are uh, trying to identify people we need to interview for solving a problem. Um, so this is for food pantries for the city of Austin. Um, we then have questions to prompt them on what are those kind of people that you need to actually talk to. Who is going to be interacting with this service on the front end? Who's going to be on the back end? What are the nonprofits that are partnering with you? So you come up with this kind of exhaustive list and are able to kind of whittle down what are the most important conversations to have early on. But being able to, well, again, walk away with those practical tools in your hand um, after you've actually walked through the process for a specific project, it makes it a lot easier for them to just keep going forward. Yeah. I think one of the things we invested on in early was making it really easy to do user research, to, to talk to representative users, and to, to think about who are my representative users, how do I reach them. Um, we have a policy where we compensate people for their time. So we're not just getting the sample of uh, residents that have free time to come and talk to us and give us feedback. Um, and so uh, putting together that policy of like, if it's, 20, if it's 10 minutes, it's $5. If it's an hour in their house, it's about, I think, $80. Um, and, and making that formalized so that other departments, after they have this experience of doing user research, uh, can, can do it on their own um, and can integrate it into their processes. Um, I think another piece is seeing uh, more departments want to create positions for service design and content strategy. Um, and so they can have a full-time person in their department uh, who's able to work with a central group of experts, um, but give them even more attention. All right. Thanks, y'all. Cool. Thank you. Mm -hmm.